Black women living abroad. Living abroad, the black experience. It's different. It is different. Showtime. Welcome. Cheers. Welcome Family. to another episode. Cheers. Hello, oh, hello. My name is the Curly Jenny. I'm a solo traveler, engineer, slash multifaceted, all the things, Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, whatever you want to call it. So today I have with me Miss Stacy. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hello. Well, would you like me to introduce you or would you like to introduce yourself? I will introduce myself. Um, hello, everyone. One, yes. My name is Stacy. I am a traveler. Um, I am also a performing artist, singer, actress, content creator, digital marketer, all of the above. Um, and love having these conversations about travel, the black experience and the interconnectivity of it all. Welcome to my living room. Me, myself and I are so happy to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for putting away some time to talk about things that we love. So should I introduce our topic? Yes. Okay. So today's topic is Black women living abroad, living abroad, the Black experience, how it is for us as a Black woman. Why did we choose this topic? So let's, let's, let's talk about the background, like why you and I just, yeah. Should we should we mention how we met beforehand? Yeah, we totally should. Yeah. So, actually, I met Stacy at my former church in Atlanta. You remember yes. those days, girl? That was such a specific time in my life. <laughs> that but... was such like we met. It wasn't a youth. It was a young adult um hangouts so hangouts. It, the the groups were like oh towards young adults which we are right i mean we're not aunties yet you're not aunties yet we're not <laughs> aunties yet <laughs> <laughs> so in this group we met each other um you were in atlanta you are not from atlanta i am not from atlanta hence the love of travel and living in new places having new experiences all of that it turns out that we were in Atlanta, in, in Atlanta at the same time. Me, I'm not from Atlanta, Dominican Republic, representing Caribbean. Hey! Yes, we so, are both Caribbean today. Yes. So, where your background is? I am Haitian and Trini. Boy, boy. <laughs> First generation American. So, hence yes. everything that, yeah. Um, the best of both worlds, I would say. I mean, I still need to try a lot of HM uh, plates, but the Trini side, I got that covered. Doubles, roti, you name it. I had it. I love it. So I'm an honorary Trini. If you watch my carnival videos, you might recognize me with some braids and stuff. But like, yeah, the best of both worlds. You can't pick two better cultures. So yeah, that's how we met, right? So why do we pick this subject, living abroad as a Black woman or the Black experience as living abroad, right? Exactly. Plus another topic, a little tangent that I would love to go down at some point during the conversation. What, what's that? What's, what's, what's the that topic? Talking about how a lot of um, destinations are losing their authenticity. Oh, we might get to that. We might have time to get to that. Hopefully, okay. fingers crossed. Let's see how we go. I really want to talk about. But yes. Totally so, fine. Really so bright. we already established how we met, right? So we've been friends since, what, 2015, 16? Yeah, sounds about right. Somewhere, somewhere around, around those lines. Um, so have you ever lived abroad? Yes, I have. So I've lived in France, in Paris specifically, which is notorious for having a reputation <laughs> for the way they treat black people. And I say black people as a whole. Ooh la la. Ooh la la. Black people. 
black Americans is different from the way they treat like African immigrants. And so, so let's 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 talk about that because some for some of our listeners it might not make sense. So like what is the difference in like Parisians? We're gonna say Parisians because you were in Paris, right? I don't wanna generalize France as a whole because everywhere you go, it's just like the States, right? If you go to New Orleans, you're gonna have a different treatment than if you go to Chicago or New York, right? Yeah. So let's talk how Parisians treat, do we call it expats or immigrants? Right. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I think we don't have time for that. We we might dab on that later, but let's call it expats because that's a trendy word, right? So how do Parisians treat black Americans versus how do Parisians treat black Africans, maybe Caribbeans? I don't know what the demographics are in Paris besides white Parisians, right? So, like, give us an insight on how was that? So I will say we kind of had to look back at history with this. So, of Ooh. course, you know, France is a colonizer. We know this. But there was this time period. You know, I'm not a historian, but there's this time period when you're thinking, like, Moulin Rouge, Josephine Baker, like, that area where, like, there's kind of this, like, stereotype that, like, Parisians loved Black Americans. Um, and so I think that kind of held for a few years um that also translated into like dating as well um but i think the t fast forward to the time period that i was there that shifted and it even shifted over the years that i was there so i was in paris for three school years total and i would say the first year that i got there i could tell that like i don't know there was just like a shift with like their reception of americans um and black americans and just So, so like, just like a side note, when you were perceived, right, because maybe they will perceive you if you don't talk, right? And if you don't get to know them personally, if they see you walking down the street, they might think you are an African immigrant because that's the, the, the population that like it's the most, right? Like you yeah. have more of that than black American, right? Like African American. Yeah. So when they thought that you were not African-American, that you were actually like African descendant immigrant, how did they treat you until they get to know you as a person, right? Right, so it's it's really this thing of like, exactly as you said, like you're perceived as one thing and then once you open your mouth, it's like, oh, you're an American. And it's just like super bizarre because there's there is a privilege with being a black American as opposed to mm -hmm. an African in Paris and that is just like the most bizarre thing ever I honestly kind of want you to talk to my friend who still lives in Paris because she talks about Ooh. this her TikTok um yeah um but and she's had like crazy experiences but I guess going back to what I was saying about like the shift you have to think about the time that I was there so I first moved to Paris in 2016 and wait are you still there or is it frozen I'm here I'm here I'm here So, so I moved first moved to Paris in 2016. Now let's think about what was going on in the world in 2016. Let's think about what was going on in America. We had an election. There was this big rise of like anti-immigrant, like sentiment across the world, not just in the United States but also in France. You know, think about I the think election. In 2016 was hot like hot hot hotline bling. I know in the hotline bling. Major throwback. I was. <laughs> I think that was the summer of 2016. <laughs> oh my gosh. But oh. um, just to add to the conversation, in 2016, I there was an, like, a major election, if you know, you know. Yes. I was not an American citizen at the time, and I saw the writings on the wall, and I'm like, you know what? Before the deci they decide to deport Dominicans, because we don't add anything to this country, let me get my citizen straight. So I decided, I saw the elections, I saw who run for primary and the Republican side and, and the Democratic side. And I'm like, you know what, this is a good time for me to become an American citizen because I've been living in the country for, at 2016, I, 
I was there for already for five years. So I was eligible to become an American citizen, having work, pay tax, and all of the shenanigans. So I was like, you know what? Before they deport me, people like me who have been trapped, who have been working and paying taxes, let me just become a citizen. And actually that was the smoothest process. And I recommend anyone who's on thinking about it that do it on an election year because it took me three months from wow. the fingerprints, from the swearing, from the tests that they do, like the, the little test that you get to become a citizen. Wow. Um, everything took three months total because they want you to vote. And that's the motivation behind it. Instead of taking years, like one yeah. or two years, election time, three months, maybe yeah. four or five months tops. But yeah. That's crazy. So wow. going back to your experience as a, when they find out that you were a black American in, in France, how, how was that treatment? Do, do they not fetish? I, I don't want to use that word, but do they love Americans or do they despise Americans? It's so bizarre. It just depends on who you talk to. Um, so, and like what circles you're in, but I will say like when I was there, it was very hard to make French friends, like Parisian. I made like one, well, I know I'm like, who's going to be listening to this or watching this? Who's going to be like, what? She doesn't consider me her friend. I will say I made like my best friend who was French. Um, you know, I had definitely had like friendships, definitely had like, or like more like um, acquaintance acquaintanceships. I was gonna say that not not every acquaintance is your friend, and not every friend is your best friend, right? So there's yeah. levels to that. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, going back to what I was saying about like the election and stuff, and like the sentiment towards like others and immigrants and all that stuff, like. Yeah, all of that combined to, like, when I was there in 2016, you could tell that there was just a shift from, like, I guess, loving, being intrigued by, like, others and stuff, I guess, to, like, there kind of being a little bit of xenophobia. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. the question was, how did they treat you as you, um, as they found out that you were American? Like, what was the treatment? Like? Right. It's just, like, yeah, so... Yeah, so many thoughts happening at once. Throw um, them, throw them. See what okay. sticks. Right. So, yeah, you're right. Um, so where was I going? Did you feel that you belong? No, <laughs> not. Which is why I left for I left because I was like, and I mean, a part of it was just like being in a city. There's certain like cultural norms that like you follow because like I think one thing that got me annoyed with like. The French subways, for example, as opposed to, like, Metro, I should say, as opposed to, like, the Tube in London was, like, I felt like, or, like, the, in the subway in New York City, like, I felt like I had to fit in a square on the Metro in Paris, whereas, like, in London, I felt a little more free to not be in that square, but I think that was probably just, like, a language and cultural difference there, and then, of course, like, when I would visit New York, I would feel like you can do whatever the heck you want and no one cares. But now that I live here in New York, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm not going to, I feel, I still feel like I need to be a little, little in the box of like, you know, don't pay attention to other people and like, just pay attention to you, um, which doesn't really completely jive with how I am. So I'm still adjusting to that. But that was like kind of my biggest thing with Paris of just feeling like everyone had to be like, everyone was like just too serious for me. It felt like. Oh, um, Yes. So compared to the UK, you would think that the UK is more relaxed while Paris is like more uptight and with like different norms and like different um, school of thoughts, right? Like it's, it's more rigid, I would yeah. say, right? Yes, definitely. And I, that did not really jive for me. Like me, like I said at the beginning, like I'm a performing artist. So like I'm an actress, I'm a singer. I love being like, you know, like extroverted, I guess, even though I can go into my shell sometimes, but I like to be like, you know, bright and colorful, I guess. Yes. And you've been on Broadway. I have been. Yes. We can just say that. <laughs> Hello. That's not a small achievement. Uh, tell us where did you participate? Um, was it Talking Boots? I, I'm so bad at reference. Kinky but what, what? Kinky, what? Kinky Boots. 
Kinky Boots. You were at Kinky Boots and you started up. Uh, you were the star or? Yeah, you were the star. I was not the star. I was just like a walk. You look like the star. So we could say like you you were the s- <sighs> star. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like i've never i've never starred i've never been in a broadway show so that's a big accomplishment like it's not a small achievement so thank you girl thank you girl i mean we are celebrating all wins and that's a big win who can say that has been, that they have been in broadway even cleaning up the bathrooms i can't say that <laughs> no that's true <laughs> it is true so what? like do not sell yourself short okay thank you miss singer actress broadway uh actress as well so okay so would you say going back to paris like why would you choose living in paris out of all the places that you could have choose because you were so we didn't say where you were originally from right yeah So I was actually born in New York City, um, daughter of immigrants. Um, so my mom's Haitian, and because of that, I know it's like convoluted, but like having a French-esque last name and like my family speaking French and Creole and not being taught growing up all pushed me to like learning French in school, like choosing that over Spanish, even though Spanish would have been more practical, but like learning French in school because I just wanted to like connect with my family in that way. Um, and so that left led to like an affinity for like French culture and French things, um, French food, whatever, um, the language, etc. Um, and also I worked in like international relations for a little bit. Like mm-hmm. I studied that and had an internship in that and was kind of like going down that path for a little bit. So I also wanted to have that language like in my back p- pocket. Um, so when the opportunity presented itself to go to Paris, I snatched that up because I mean, who doesn't want to like, live abroad for the first time, you know. Um, so did you choose Paris um, over other, was Paris your main choice and you didn't look at other choices or were there other cities that you were also considering to live abroad? No, it was like my only choice because basically I, France was my choice. So I applied to a program to teach English in France and Paris was like my top choice and I got it. For those of us that are not well versed on this on these programs and that would like to get to look into what was that program, what was the name and, and how long did it take? Like was it very um scrutinous? Scrut but but boop boop boop. Um um <laughs> now I'm thinking myself, um scrut where did they scrutinize, I guess? Like was it like highly scrutinized, I guess, with the process and such? Um, so I'll just run through it really quickly. So the program is called Teaching Assistant Program in France or called TACIF. Applications open in October and I think they close in January. You find out in April and then you are shipped over to, not shipped, but you go to France in October. Um, and it's for nine months. So like October, beginning of October to the end of April. Um, and you have to apply. Um, by like writing a letter in French and you need recommendations. I think two recommendations, um, like, I guess, French related, whether that's like a French teacher, like a French language group you're a part of. Um, and then I, and basically like you choose if you want to be in a big city, a medium sized city or a small town. Um, and then, so they have like big cities and as a first stop in the big cities one, so like Paris, Paris, Lyon. Um, and then you have, yeah, middle size, small size. So that's, you don't even get to choose your city. You just say like, I want to be in this area, like in the big city so, or small. And they just for, place. For full transparency, like, um, I know you have been out of that program for a minute, but the last time you cash a check, right? So you were in Paris, like how would you, how much would you make a month? Um, I think it was about a thousand dollars, like USD. And was that enough to survive in Paris? I will say it's not enough if you're not provided housing. So a lot of people, so I was like on the outskirts of Paris. So I was like in a town that actually provided housing. I call it Paris because literally the subway will take you, the metro will take you there. Not even like the the commuter train, but the actual metro. It was like 
my stop was the last stop in Paris. So I was like, this is Paris. Um, <laughs> But I will say for other people, they definitely, like, you needed savings at least. Um, you needed maybe to be, like, an au pair. Not an officially an au pair, but, like, to nanny because sometimes you can, um, you know, exchange a few hours of nannying for, like, a place to live or, like, a room or, like, a, a tiny little studio apartment on, like, the rooftop, like, a rooftop apartment in Paris, which is, looks super cute. Um, yeah. So, um, so you would need a site hustle in addition to this program to be able to survive in Paris. Or saving. So if, huh? Or, I mean, I wouldn't, like, you need savings, but just, a, I wouldn't, like, a lot of savings. But you need, you would probably need a little bit of something because, like, you can get reduced housing because you're not paid that much. So you can get, you can apply for this thing called CAF, the CAF, I forgot what it actually stands for, but you can apply for that to reduce your housing. But the thing is you usually don't get a check until like the end of the program. So you need to be able to like pay rent and then maybe be reimbursed. Keyword maybe. Um, and the average, were you renting by yourself or you were renting a room? So they provided housing for me, which was oh, like, great. Eight, and yes, I happened to be in like a bougie, um, town essentially and they provide like yeah this is like a high income town so I guess they were able to provide housing for their assistance for the assistance oh. Ooh la la. I know definitely hashtag blessed so I know because of your cultural black background because of your family uh ties you felt very um not confident, but you felt very inclined to do Paris. If you were to do it all over again, like today, like Stacy today. Yes. Where would you choose to like do a program like that? What, which city, which country would you choose to be like, okay, I want to live a year abroad and I want to experience that. And I want to live this place. What, what, what place would it be? Mm. I would probably do like Asia or Africa. Okay, that's two continents, a uh, hundred, a hundred, a uh, hundred countries. So we have to summarize it. Okay, so uh, <laughs> Africa has fifty-four countries or something like that. So let's 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 summarize and at least pick two countries in Africa and two countries in Asia, so we can have a like. Okay, what 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 is your train of train of thoughts, right? So. Okay, I would probably go to Rwanda. Ooh, Rwanda. Oh, so many of the organizations are women-led. Um, and then in Africa, sorry, in Asia, um, probably Korea, probably Korea. Okay. I made a lot of, like, Korean friends. Would you, do you know a little bit of uh, Korean? Um, Yobaseyo. Oh. Um, uh, Chincha. 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 Mm. <laughs> I haven't learned anything in Korean, but I know a little bit of Japanese. Japanese is actually, if you know Spanish, the phonetics is somewhat similar. So if I'm reading them in Roman um, characters, not the kanji katana characters, I would be able to like speak phonetically because like I could say like uh oh hi gozaimas uh jenny desu and parahetta <laughs> so like just like I'm hungry. So <laughs> that's like five years of learning in Japanese companies so <laughs> me Ooh. working that yeah so I caught up on that so when I was in Japan, I was able to get by with Google Translate. So I would just read it and they would understand. Like they would, oh, she means this. So might not be perfect, but it I got by with it. I so I would say, um, just to talk about a little bit about my experience living abroad also, I don't know if this counts, right? Because I... I am born and raised Dominican, so being in the States is living abroad. However, I have also most recently the, I, I went back home, so that could, uh, 
that could be also, but uh, most recently I went to Brazil for three months. So I could say like that was living, although I was traveling as well. Yeah. Um, and if I could pick like a place to live abroad, I've always said that I wanted to do an Europe ex a European experience. I don't care in Europe or I love Turkey, Greece, uh, Czech Republic, Amsterdam. You name it. The UK, I would I would get by with the weather also, but I really want to be in a place that I could just travel like, you know what? I want to go to Paris for the for the afternoon. So just take the train and we'll just have dinner in Paris in Paris. Ooh la la, c'est la vie. Oui. Tu oui. Oui. Yeah. Oui. So I feel like I still want I have that desire to like at least a year abroad in Europe, like wherever in Europe, what wherever. So I could just like fly over like, oh, I'm going to go to Rome, Lisbon. I'm going to be going to these places over the weekend. And I'm just like so close that I could do that. Right. Um, that being said, I have not made it to Africa yet. And I am so embarrassed oh. by that I know that exactly. So I've been to all over except Africa. I've been Indonesia. I haven't been to Australia, but South America, North America, Central America, you name it. Southeast Asia, Asia as a whole, Europe as a whole, nothing in Africa. So I really think like my next vacation or time that I have, I need to be uh, intentional and I need to go to Africa. Just pull the, pull the trigger, pick one country, whatever's cheap to get there and just like experiment that. Yes. Have you been to Africa? I've not. So like, not even like Morocco, you know, which a lot of people that oh, like from Paris, they go to Morocco, did not make it there. Well, it's still on the bucket list. So we okay. still have time. Hopefully. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. if so, um, what would you say were the struggles living in Paris? Like, what would you like reminisce in that time? Like, what were your struggles that maybe you missed from the U S or you missed? Like, of course we miss family and friends. Right. But like living there, having a job and mm -hmm. living and social life, what mm -hmm. would you consider like your struggles or just like hard stuff that you had to go through? Mm. The number one thing that comes up is l'administration française. Oh my god. Am I saying it wrong? L'administration française. Oui. Anyway, said it right the first time. And that is the French administration. Um, wow. So just like all the paperwork, so much paperwork, so many hoops to jump through. It's just very difficult. It's not, nothing is just easy and straightforward. So thank God I had people to help me along the way. Um, other than that, so in what I, sense was the French, would, would you say government or French admin? Everything admin. Like, for example, like just trying to set up like your phone account or trying to set up like Wi-Fi. Oh, that was like so annoying. And really? All them and have to cancel and having to explain that or like if there's an outage. It's just like hard to like. I mean, customer service stuff is annoying in general and then having to do it in another language is like. Oh my gosh, it's it's the next boss if we're thinking in video games. It is it's oh. a <laughs> um what else was really hard? What did you miss from the states that you didn't have uh in France or or not from the states but from your family? Like what were the things like, oh I wish I had this, I wish I had that in France while you were in France? I mean, I don't know if I like missed people like that because I was just like it was like an adventure and it was only I was only there for like nine months I was making friends and everything because um yeah um but I think what was hard was just kind of thinking about the future because it's like you see what everyone like everyone had a different path some people only did the program one year I did it for two years some people like were dating and so it was like they were trying to figure that out if they were going to stay in France etc or like some people like 
you know, were thinking about getting their master's. It was just like, there's so many different things, so many different avenues that could happen. So it really was just like sitting down. Cause like when I left for Paris, it was like, I was escaping my life in, in um, Atlanta because I didn't know, I wasn't fulfilled by the work that I was doing in Atlanta. Um, and I felt like I needed to change. I needed to figure out myself, et cetera, et cetera. So like when I was in Paris, I was only working part time. Like it was just a very easy, like bohemian lifestyle, I guess. So it really afforded me the time to really just think about my path. Um, and I feel like that's also like in your mid twenties, that's also what's going on no matter where you are. Um, so yeah, all of that compounded and that's what made it not hard, but just like, like an interesting time. <laughs> What would you say were your highlights, right? Like, what was the highlight of living in France uh, or living in Paris? Mm, highlights. So many highlights. The first year was magical because it was like, oh, my gosh. It was beautiful because it was, like, so new. It was just, yeah, so novel. But, like, the second year was, like, less magical because, but it was so it awesome. Huh? It it came it it uh it got old right like it it was like been there done that <laughs> a little bit yeah especially because like I kind of was there and like that wasn't really like if I was planning to stay in Paris it would have made more sense but like it felt kind of like almost aimless not aimless but I wasn't sure of my next steps so it was kind of like I was there because okay, this is my second year, but there wasn't really anything tying me there. So like I moved back to the United States and a slew of things happened until I decided to go back to Paris during COVID and get my master's. Wait, you got a master's in Paris? I sure did. So oh. comparing that, like that experience, like having a master's in Paris and having a master's in, in the U.S., I know for a fact, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that if you get it, if you get your master's in Europe, it's like $2,000, while if you get your master's in the U.S., it's $100,000. So would you share, like, how much was did that cost and, like, in terms of, like, what would be the difference if you have gotten it in the U.S. or gotten it in Paris? For sure. So I'm not going to go into like the exact numbers. Um, don't want to put all my business out there. But yes, that comparison you made is true. But I will say like, mine was a little more expensive than that, because my school was a private school. But if you do go to a public school, yes, it's going to be like 2000, not even. Uh, but it's not 100,000. It's not 100,000. It's not 60,000. Like, it's definitely like a manageable number, but it's just how it happened that because I went to a private school, it was a little bit more than that 2000 that you were saying. But it's not a house down. Well, not even down payment. It's a house cost. Well, back in the day, like what a hundred thousand dollar house you get in Montana, maybe. Right. Maybe. <laughs> oh, oh, it sucks so much. I know that's not the topic of our conversation. But, uh, why? So yeah. Either. Can you see my, I need to adjust. Hold on. Just yes, talk. because we see a shadow. Okay. I mean, yeah, there's a shadow, but it's yeah, bright. There's, we can see you bright and early. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Can we talk about my favorite topic, which is tourist places being um, watered down? How are over touristy, over or overpopulated uh, or over touristy, highly populated destinations are losing their authenticity. And how can you talk about it? I know I cannot uh, talk about it from my culture side, but I would like to know your point of view on that. Oh, this is something that has been on my mind for so long. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I will give two examples of two places that I visited that I felt like, I well, not even. Barely, but I can. <sighs> Cuba and Aruba. They match. What? Match, but like. Um, like that's on the. Opposite spectrums. Opposite side of the X spectrum. Like the, they don't even. That's what I'm saying. Not same language, not same culture, not same coins. So you're saying. So you're saying that these places are not 
authentic or the oh. touristy places I'm are losing their authenticity? They're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Not completely. Oh, yes. They're on different lines. Like, there's a whole spectrum. There's a spectrum <laughs> that side that's, like, untouched by the tourist world and over, like, um, too many tourists. We'll say that. So... Cuba, that felt pretty authentic. Havana was a little less authentic in certain ways, but like it, pro it felt pretty authentic. Aruba, the way I had to ask so many people, where can I listen to soca? Wait, Aruba has soca? I mean, it's like, you know, kind of. <laughs> so, it's a type, but like, I was like, I want like authentic Aruban music mm -hmm. and like caribbean music i just wanted to hear yeah you should expect to hear like soca and like aruba you should not be expecting to listen to like top 40 and that's what so, i got so i'm going i'm going to generalize and that's a no-no but let me talk about my experience in curacao when i went to curacao curacao has a big influx of dominicans so it's intermixed. So there's, I don't think there's an end, like the beginning of Curacao culture without the Dominican. Um, any person you meet in Curacao, it will speak five language. So yeah. Spanish, Papiamento, Dutch, maybe German, something else, English as well. So when I went to Curacao, I was listening to the radio, right? And I'm like, okay, let's see what they hear. I heard them both. Dembo is like mainly Dominican. Like Dembo mm -hmm. is not anywhere in the world. Like Dembo is not reggaeton. The bone is like very much Dominican. Mm -hmm. So it's like saying soca, right? Which is Trini and West Indies. And now it's like getting like around the world. But Dembo, when I heard the Curas Curacao Sensei, Cura I need to look what's what's the actual word but like the people from curacao i was like wait a minute this is papiamento in the bow like this is crazy so i heard bachata which is dominican mm -hmm. with papiamento which i couldn't understand so i'm like what what are you guys saying like i don't understand it but the influence of dominican culture in curacao was like deep and grain and i'm like wow i i cannot fathom and they have merengue bachata dembo with that sense it was not reggaeton it was dembo with papiamento and i was like that's that's crazy so in aruba which i think they also speak papiamento i'm not sure if they speak papiamento that sounds right it's been a while it's been a couple years. but i feel like maybe maybe you might have gone to the touristy side and not to the local side, or did you went out of your way to find the locals? That's fair. I stayed in the tourist areas because, you know, okay. single woman traveler, first time there. I'm Listen, not right we now. don't want to get, we don't want to get clogged. We don't want to get, we want to come back home. So that's all fair game. It's, it's all fair game. So I, I would say comparing your story, Punta Cana. People say like, oh, I'm going to Punta Cana, I'm going to DR. No, Punta Cana is not DR. Punta Cana might be New York. Punta Cana might be Miami. Punta Cana is everything but DR because you have Cirque du Soleil. We don't even have Cirque du Soleil in the capital in Santo Domingo, where there's 3 million people. Punta Cana has its own Cirque du Soleil. And if you know, like, that's not cheap. Like, what? how much is a ticket to Cirque du Soleil? At least $100, right? Yeah. So Punta Cana is very much, I won't say Amer Americanized, because it could be European, also a lot of influence from mm. other countries, but it's everything but Dominican. So... I hear your pain and I feel your pain when you're saying like these touristy places, like they're not authentic. Like people think like, oh, I'm going to a resort in Cancun. Yeah, you're not going to Mexico. You yeah. might as well go to Vegas. Right. If you I know. That's so true. 
That's so real, yeah. That's a good point. You make an excellent point. I did not consider it in that light that it's like, that's why. So I wonder, yeah, if I were to go. But the other thing is like, I mean, that's true. I'm trying to think if there's been a place where I've gone that's a little, like, less touristy. Like, I guess, for example, like, brunch. It's like, you can have the same brunch anywhere you go around the world. And I'm just like, I want, like, to eat what y'all are eating for breakfast. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to eat what I would eat in America for breakfast. And I mean, there are definitely, like, variations depending on where you go. But, like, you know, I'm like... I, I don't, I just really don't like that, that it's, like, these tourists, like, tourist, um, um, destinations, centers. yeah, tourist destination, tourist centers, I don't like that they're so, that it's, like, the same everywhere, so, like, what's the point of going, if it's gonna be the same experience that you're gonna get in Miami, same experience you're gonna get anywhere else, it's just that you took a plane along des long distance to get there so that's that's my problem so like you make a good point but I'm still mad about it <laughs> which you know like there's not a right or wrong answer because again I'm not from Aruba I'm not from Punta Cana I'm from the capital so like the the right way of doing these things is like bringing up some people from there to speak like their frustrations like New Yorkers hate tourists and that's a fact. Right. Like, like New Yorkers hate tourists because they're slow. They're looking up in the air like, oh, my gosh, this is so amazing. But they're like, I need to be somewhere. So move. <laughs> so it's not that they hate people. It's just like you're in my way. So I'm going to push you. So it's the same. I would think that it's the same thing in France. It's the same thing in um, in Paris. It's the same thing in and um, in places like Aruba, in places like Punta Cana, like you would still have your like gentrified spaces that will cater to those tourists. But Cancun is the. I don't under. I don't get it. I'm like I understand it's capitalism, and it's like you need you want to be attractive to attract as many people as you can. But it's like, why? Like I understand, but also I'm like no stop stop but at the same time they're not gonna stop because it makes money but it's like uh. i would say that it comes down to capitalism aruba is one of the countries that lives solely of tourism curacao everything in curacao is imported i paid well i went to the to the supermarket and i was looking at a a quarter or maybe a, an eighth of watermelon, it was $8. Can you imagine how much a um, watermelon would have been? Like, I guess 40 or something like that, a whole watermelon. So That's crazy. All, these, all these countries, and I've seen it in St. Kitts, which I've been three times, they import coconuts. And I'm like, but you're an island. How is it that you're importing coconuts from another island when you can grow it? Call it politics, call it, call it whatever decision it is. But like, it is crazy when, and Curacao, I can't speak by Aruba, but I went to Curacao, the food, expensive, gas, expensive. more expensive. You name it. Everything is expensive. Yeah. I think the only free stuff is the beaches. They don't charge you entry unless it's a beach club. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that that's definitely was a thing in Haiti or is a thing in Haiti um, as well. Like, that's just like something like a problem in the West Indies with colonization. Like, you know, like obviously all of these countries produce their own products, but the systems that be make it so that they must import and it's trash it is it is well just just to recap right yeah so we love the experience will we do it again living abroad yeah will we do it in the same place or we would choose somewhere else i had i would probably do it in the same place but maybe break it up one year here, one year there. So like different places in France or like different places in 
that too. Just, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I would say that if I had the opportunity to live abroad for a season, I would take it in a heartbeat. I, I, nothing is temporary. Like everything is, no, nothing is permanent. Everything is temporary. You can always go back home. You can always go back to what you know. And there is no, like, it is beautiful to experience something that you have it. So to you, even though you had some ups and downs, I feel like from your experience, it was more up than down. Yes. Because you still want to go back to France. It was formative, definitely. I mean, yeah. nothing like living somewhere else, okay, and being challenged. Exactly. Exactly. Because even you being in Atlanta and you being in New York, like that, those are different scenarios and those are different challenges, which they challenge you, even though you're from here. But even every state, every city, they have their own differences that you have to adjust to it. Yes, 1,000%. Especially, yeah. And it's so interesting how, like, it's still an adjustment for me, like, as an American in New York, you know? You know, there's just, yeah. there are layers. There are layers to this thing. And I would say that to any Black woman who's listening to this, to anyone who got till this point of the episode and you're still listening, I would say go for it. The worst thing that you could think of is like regretting not to do something. I, I'm one of the school of thoughts that say, I prefer to try something. If it didn't work, I said, well, I, I came, I saw, didn't conquer, but I, at least I tried it. Yeah, that's you for sure. But, exactly. But I prefer to do that than what if. Mm -hmm. What if I had done that? What if I would have bit the bullet, um, just like go for it and just say like, you know what? I'm going to go for it and see what happens. I, I am a firm believer that I prefer to say like, I tried it. It didn't work out. It wasn't for me. It might be for someone else. So good, good riddance, good luck <laughs> to those, those other people. But, like, I know that that's not for me. Then to be like, oh, what if I had gone to France? What if I had gone to Rwanda? What if I had gone to Brazil? Like, all these places. Yes. Absolutely. We, well, me, myself, and I are so happy to have you. Thank you so much for spending this evening with me and... Um, on all the technical problems that we had, like, thank you so much for bearing with me. <laughs> yes, thank you. I am so happy to have you as guest number two. Oh. Um, number two. Oh. And I know this won't be the last time because we have a lot of things to talk about. Most definitely. Most, de most definitely. So do you want to leave the audience with something, with some gems to... Um, to look forward or whatever like if you want to leave the audience with some gems like feel free to do so i'm gonna let you shine okay i mean i feel like you really wrapped up everything we discussed and left everyone with an awesome takeaway that was fabulous but i guess if i have anything to add it would be just like don't hold yourself back in thinking oh that's for someone else only that person can do that I can't do that. No, 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 no. You can too. Research it. That can be a part of your life. Don't even think about your past. Feeling like, oh, my past does not lead me to going to teach in Eng English in like another country. No, no, no. Each day is a new day. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. I can't wait to see you on the next episode. Thank you so much for your time. I'll edit this and upload it. And I'll see you on the next one. Okay. Well, bye. Adieu. Adieu. No, not adieu. A tout à l'heure. At. Allo. Da.